Hi folks, thanks for joining us for the second installment in our Book of Hope Conservation Case Studies series. If you missed our previous show, here's the lowdown. A recent review of successful Australian conservation projects coordinated by the Threatened Species Recovery Hub of the National Environmental Science Program led to a book entitled Recovering Australian Threatened Species, A Book of Hope, now available from CSIRO Publishing. In this second series of case studies, we'll be exploring some of the amazing bird conservation successes from the Book of Hope with various chapter authors. Uh, for more on the subject, you can check out our mammal case studies in episode 26 and our interview with the book's lead editor, Professor Stephen Garnett from Charles Darwin University in episode 22. You can also check out the book now from CSR Publishing and all good book retailers. Our serving suggestion for this avian episode is poppy seed cake and a nice simple gin and tonic. Alrighty, onto the show. Cheers, everyone. And we've got another wildlife cake and cocktails case study for the Threatened Species Recovery Hub Book of Hope. Uh, we're talking Eastern Bristlebird Conservation today with Professor David Lindenmayer. Uh, following a Bachelor of Science from Australian National Uni and a Diploma of Ed at Adelaide Uni, and then a PhD and a uh, Doctorate of Science in was it, Diploma of Doctorate of Science in 2003 at ANU, David has spent over 30 years in landscape ecology and conservation working with numerous species, published over 600 journal articles and 40 books. He's a member of the Australian Academy of Sciences and New York Academy of Sciences and has numerous accolades for his work, including an Order of Australia in 2014 for Distinguished Service to Conservation and Landscape Ecology. Uh, his research includes world-leading programs in environment and natural resource management, terrestrial ecology, environmental monitoring, wildlife and habitat management, forestry sciences, and more. He's currently a professor of conservation and landscape ecology at the Australian National Uni, a theme leader at Threatened Species Recovery Hub in monitoring and management, and one of the lead editors of the Book of Hope, and also here to talk to us today about Eastern Bristlewoods. Uh, David, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to have you on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Excellent. And where, where, uh, where are you at the moment? Where are we uh, calling you at? Uh, I'm actually at home in Canberra, uh, looking out over the, um, the, the woodlands quite close to my home. Wonderful, wonderful. So we, we may actually get a few uh, local Canberra bird calls in the background then. Uh, you may do. Uh, sulfur crested cockatoos, uh, eastern spinebills, uh, silver eyes and quite a number of other things. So that's always a pleasure to have that in my own backyard. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, all right, well, look, uh, we got to get to it. Let's start talking uh, eastern bristlebirds. So, Dazionis brachypetrus, is that right? Uh, let's leave it at that. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Dazionis brachypetrus, uh, a medium-sized, long-tailed, uh, brown rufousy in colour. Now, I understand they're terrestrial, and they can only fly fairly short distances. Yes, that's true. It's, it's an in interesting animal. It spends most of its time tucked away on the ground. Uh, and it's it's kind of almost like a little uh, a small mammal with wings. It doesn't fly <laughs> very much, and it's it's quite it's quite cryptic in some ways. So, interestingly, when we work on small mammals and medium-sized mammals in the, in the Buddha National Park where we work, we often ca end up catching eastern bristlebirds in the traps that are set on the ground. So, it spends its whole almost all of its life on the ground where it calls and nests and feeds. So. Yeah, interesting bird. So do you mean like the Elliot box traps, the closing box traps you use to uh, survey for small mammals and things like that? They'll happily crawl into a box trap after some kind of bait. Uh, that's true. And yes, peanut butter, honey and rolled oats. <laughs> um, and, but we also sometimes catch them in small cage traps. So they're obviously quite inquisitive and they're attracted to the bait. And um, yeah, we probably catch maybe 15 or 20, 30 birds each year that way even though they're not the target that we're trying to trap wow that's um that's uh, fascinating for something that's apparently um pretty shy and cryptic and mostly occurring in pretty sort of uh dense vegetation where you wouldn't imagine that there's a whole lot of room for for trapping particularly things like uh you know uh, fences uh, you know drift fences and things like that where you put these traps a lot of the time yeah that's true uh, so it has been a surprise and and the the other interesting thing is that over the years we've been catching increasing numbers of these critters um, which is an indirect way of suggesting that probably the populations are continuing to, to increase, although ever so slowly across the park. Right, right. And obviously it would be ever so slowly from what I understand um, because they only, uh, well, they, they lay uh, about two eggs but only raise one of the chicks. Is, uh, is that right? That's my understanding. And one of the things that I think is really important here is that because it's a ground-dwelling bird, 
it is quite sensitive to the effects of, of uh, feral predators like foxes and cats. And in Bouderie National Park, we don't have many cats. In fact, in the last 15 years, we've only got records across all the sand plots and the, the bait, poison bait stations and spotlighting. We've only got records of 21 cats in, in all of that time. Wow. Well, where, whereabouts, sorry, whereabouts exactly is Bouderie National Park? So Bouderie National Park is about 200 kilometres south of Sydney. And in fact, the best way to think about it is it's basically Sydney without all the development. It's uh, <laughs> got an extraordinary set of, of cliffs, beautiful cliff lines, uh, amazing heathland like you might see at Karingai Chase National Park or Royal National Park. Um, really quite a spectacular place, but only a, a few small villages all around the edge of the bay. And uh, it really makes it a remarkable place. Some of the, the highest sea cliffs in, in eastern Australia. Wow. So um, probably, uh, you know, ideal sort of habitat for, for these uh, coastal, dense coastal vegetation birds. But nonetheless, they're uh, uh, threatened under the uh, EPBC Act. That's correct. It's a bird that is in a lot of trouble in almost all parts of its distribution. In fact, the northern, the northern eastern bristle birds, so that's up around Brisbane and that way, that's the best place to describe it, is, is doing very badly. And the animal has basically been lost from almost all of the rest of its distribution right throughout eastern Australia. And it seems likely that there are a couple of things happening. The first one is that there's been pretty extensive clearing and development of, of coastal heathlands all up and down the east coast. And the other thing is that um, with changes in the way that fire burns in those environments, coupled with uh, a much higher burden of, of fox and cat predation, then bristlebirds are really in a really bad way. And so one of the great things about Bouderie National Park is it's really one of the last strongholds for this species. And there's been a truly intensive fox baiting program for many years now, in fact, since 1999. And that baiting program was intensified in 2003. And bristlebirds now appear to be all across the park 6,600 hectares right across the park in almost every habitat that uh, that occurs in the environment. So that's that's a pretty special outcome, a really positive outcome. Yeah, well, look, that's that's great to hear because you know, as I understand, you know, this thing's pretty much basically it could be almost ecologically compared to a small mammal, and it's those critical weight range mammals that, as I understand, are really in 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 trouble. So it's it's good to know that they do have somewhere where they're um uh, more and more commonly accidentally caught in Elliot boxes. That's right. That's right. So that's, that is unexpected. In fact, the first time that we began to work there, the conventional wisdom was that eastern bristle birds only occurred in dense, interconnected, prickly heaths, and that was likely because foxes and cats couldn't get into those kinds of environments. And one of the most staggering things that we found, in fact, on the very first day that we were doing formal field surveys across the park, because our remit for working in that park was to do monitoring surveys right across all the different environments. So that's subtropical rainforest, heathland, woodland, forest, casuarina woodland, etc., etc. And what we discovered was that in many cases, eastern bristlebirds were in those habitats as well as the heathland. In fact, the first day that we all got together as a team and we came back to report what we, what we had heard and seen, people were saying, well, I had this really weird call and it was in a casuarina woodland and in the end it turned out to be an eastern bristle bird i really wasn't expecting that someone else would say yes we were in the sedge lands and we got eastern bristle birds and everybody came back reporting virtually the same thing and it was then that we started to think wow something's really going on here that's important and then just a year later about half of the park burnt and everybody was very depressed and was thinking, well, that's going to be the end of most of the eastern bristlebirds because, again, the conventional wisdom was that it was going to take about seven to nine years for the birds to recover. And lo and behold, what happened was that uh, birds persisted in most of the burnt areas. And we think that that's because the park staff got straight into the, the process of baiting for foxes and cats. And, and that's very important, particularly after fire, because that's when some of these ground-dwelling animals can be really vulnerable to being picked off by exotic predators. Right. So when a, when a wildfire clears all that dense coastal vegetation that they hide in, the, um, the predation problem becomes a, a lot worse for them, obviously. Yes. So what happens is that the really important cover that provides shelter from predators is taken away. 
and that makes them very vulnerable to all kinds of things but particularly particularly some of these feral animals and work by other people has shown that after some of these major fire events what happens is that they, they become very attractive places for animals to move often very large distances to, to start foraging in these burnt areas probably because it's a much easier place to find food so therefore it became really important to get out there straight after those fires and restock the poison bait stations to control the foxes. In fact, the bait take did increase directly after the fire and then dropped away steeply after that. And, and uh, so I think the, the persistence of the eastern bristlebird in those areas directly after fire was, was largely due to the park response to control feral predators directly after, the, after that big burn. Right. So um, obviously, you know, a lot of that intensive uh, control of feral predators going on. Um, what other kind of actions were, were, were taken throughout the park? I, I'm, I'm guessing that there was some fire management as well involved? Yes, there's been, been quite a lot of fire management, but it's mostly in the context of controlling a, a really particularly nasty weed called bitter bush. So if you bear with me for a second, what happened was many years uh, before the park was declared, there was extensive grazing by livestock in part of the park and many of the sens quite sensitive sand dunes lost their vegetation and the sand started moving into the ocean. So essentially the, one of the peninsulas of the park was starting to fall to pieces. And so the solution was to try to stabilise the dunes and they used uh, an, in, an imported uh, shrub called bitter bush, also sometimes known as bone seed, came from, from South Africa to stabilise the dunes. And that was very successful at stabilising the dunes, but at the same time it, it essentially cemented in place a really noxious weed, which changes the environment quite dramatically. And, and, and it alters the habitat for, for animals like the, the, the bristlebird. So what the park staff also have to do now is not only control exotic feral predators, but it also has to ex um, control exotic plants, highly invasive plants, and bitter bush is one of them. And so they use fire to, to start to control bitu bush in quite a sophisticated way. So what they do is they spray, spray the bitu bush and kill it and then they burn it and that brings up the seed in the soil and then they spray the seed again. And so there's this process of, of spray, burn, spray. And that's very successful at controlling bitu bush. But often what happens when you do that is that you create what's called a weed-shaped hole. And what that means is that you create a, a vacuum into which not native plants, but bitter bush would just simply reinvade. And so you've just got this endless cycle of treatment, control, and then reinvasion. But what we found was that the park was, was doing the, the spray burn spray process in precisely the right way, which actually controlled bitter bush, but then allowed plants to start to reinvade the system and recover and so what we've actually seen then is that once that's begun to be effective eastern bristle birds are now starting to colonize those areas where bitu bush has been successfully controlled okay so you get patches where uh, they're supported yes so so we have habitat native habitat recreated after the the weed control and then that native habitat is now being recolonized not only by a whole range of other mammals and reptiles and birds, but also the eastern bristlebird. So that's a really good news story for really successful management of, a, of really what's one of Australia's 20 most noxious weeds. Yeah, wow. That's, um, that sounds like an intensive effort. It's very intensive effort, but it's also, it's, uh, it's also um, something that just has to be done because this is such an invasive weed you really need to do something about it, otherwise your environments are radically changed. And, and then uh, the fauna is also radically changed by those modifications to the environment. Right, right. Now, um, what about other populations? I understand that there, uh, there has been some attempts at translocation as well? That's right. So, so the park has had a history of, of declines and localised extinctions over time. So uh, there, are no, uh, there are no wombats in the park. There are no goannas, for example, and that's partly because there are no mound-building termites, oh, right, which is where goannas lay their eggs. Um, but, but over the years, other animals have gone extinct, like the yellow belly glider is an example, and the tiger quoll. And, and prior to that, perhaps about 100 years ago, 
uh, other animals like the uh, the long-nosed potteroo and the eastern quoll were also quite common in the park, but they've also gone extinct. So in more recent times, there's there's been quite a process of bringing back some of these these species to repopulate the park. So there's been three uh, introductions so far, reintroductions. The long-nosed potteroo, which is still persisting in the park, although at very low numbers. The southern brown bandicoot, which is doing quite well. And most recently was the eastern quoll. So that's a, that's a small, uh, almost like a native cat, really quite stunning animal. So we have ginger coloured ones and then much darker coloured ones, each with these extraordinary spots all over their bodies. And um, that both, both uh, the bandicoot study and the quoll study have been really interesting and instructive in terms of uh, understanding what makes for successful reintroductions and some of the things that we have to do to assist the recovery of some of these populations. Yeah, right. That's awesome. Well, look, uh, let's get back to the uh, eastern bristle bird now, just briefly. Um, what's the situation for them now with all of the um, uh, the fire management and the feral predator control and uh, controlling the, uh, was it the bitu bush? That's that's correct, bitu bush. So, so the situation has been that the control programs for, for invasive plants and for invasive animals looks to have been very successful. And uh, over the last 15 years or so of intensive monitoring, there's pretty good evidence that bristle birds are, are slowly occupying more and more parts of the park and the population is, is either stable or slightly increasing as time goes on. And so that's really positive. What is even more positive, I think, is that because the populations of bristlebirds have done so well at Budaree National Park over such a long time now, it's become a source population to reintroduce animals to other parts of uh, the Jarvis Bay area. So there's a, an area called Beecroft Weapons Training Area on the other side of the peninsula, which is run by the Department of Defence as a military training area. And with fox control on that side of the peninsula now, that allowed eastern bristlebirds to start to be reintroduced over there. And one of our last surveys that we did there a couple of years ago indicated that eastern bristlebirds were on every single one of the 40 sites on that, on that uh, Beecroft weapons training area. So that was, that's a, you know, a fantastic outcome. And um, you know, it is a wonderful place to go. Again, extraordinary cliffs, amazing heathland, and when you know what you're listening for, each one of the sites that we've worked at, there we go. There's the eastern bristlebirds. So you know, this, this amazing call that, uh, that the, the birds make really adds to the incredible richness of sound that you hear when you're over there. Yeah, well, that's awesome. That's great to hear that you guys have, uh, that the populations are increasing and uh, that they're um, uh, expanding outside of the park as well. Um, I guess uh, while, just while we're wrapping up, uh, what are some of the reasons for uh, for the success in uh, in the recovery of this uh, species in, in your eyes? Well, I think there's a number of reasons. One, one is that uh, there's a really good set of, of management plans for both the weapons training area and for Buddha National Park. The first thing. The second thing is that there's been really detailed monitoring in both places to know what's really happening so we can actually report success because we measured it. The third thing is that there's been a very strong partnership between uh, the scientists uh, through the ANU and the managers of Buddha National Park. That's both the indigenous managers and the white fellow managers. And so there's that science manager partnership, which I think is really critical. The fourth thing is that there's been stability of funding in the long term, which has ensured that the monitoring can, can take place, but also the management can, can take place so that the, the, the ongoing control of feral predators is happening, the ongoing control of weeds is happening, and uh, that can be coupled up with the monitoring to tell whether those interventions that are taking place are really working or not. So there's some, I think there's some really good, good connections here that are quite quite instructive for how we should do really good work, how we should do the work around uh, monitoring, how we should do the work around management and how we should link the two, the, 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 the management and the monitoring. So that's, I, I think that's, that's very instructive for, for how we can do this kind of thing in other places as well. 
Yeah, right. Look, it, it is always uh, great to see that close relationship between you know the scientific research side and the on-ground management side, um, as well as with you know the funding and the community as well. So um, yeah, really awesome to see uh, you know the kind of uh, re recovery and uh, I guess expansion of this species. That's uh, yeah, really great. Um, uh, just briefly uh, before we go, uh, how's the future looking for the eastern bristlebird? At this stage, I'd have to say that it, that it's looking really good. Um, this is not an easy time for the environment in terms of um, there seems to be a, a, a reluctance on the part of government to, to really get involved in, in environmental success stories, which I think is an absolute uh, tragedy at the moment, and I hope that that will change soon. So the effectiveness of some of these programs are really only going to stay effective if we maintain the effort and we maintain the management and we maintain the learning. So the really important thing here is that Australia does have many major environmental problems and it does take good effort, smart science and uh, a tenacity to keep things going to make sure that that's still the case. So um, that's, that's the big issue I think is to maintain, is to maintain the, the continuity of effort, the continuity of funding and use science to keep improving things so that we can keep making good gains. Yeah, no worries. Couldn't agree with you more. Uh, Professor David Lindemeyer, we're going to have to wrap it up here. Thank you so much for joining us today. This has been really super interesting. And, um, you know, obviously, if you're ever in town, we'd uh, love to catch up and have a cake and a cocktail with you uh, here on the couch. Fantastic. Thank you very much. All right. No worries, everybody. That's been Professor David Lindenmeyer. Plenty more wildlife cake and cocktails coming up for you guys shortly. Cheers. Talk soon. today with uh, Lewis Ortiz Catedral. Uh, he completed a Bachelor of Science in Botany and Plant Biology at the Uni of Guadalajara in Mexico in 2001, and then a Master's in Ecology and a PhD in Conservation Biology in 2011 at Massey University in New Zealand, where he is currently a lecturer in Environmental Science and Ecology. Uh, his, re his research covers a range of conservation topics from plant taxonomy to reproductive biology and management of threatened bird species, and stopping biodiversity loss on islands. So he's joining us uh, right now all the way from New Zealand to talk uh, Norfolk Island Green Parrots. Uh, Lewis, thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. No worries. It's great to have you on. Uh, whereabouts in New Zealand are you calling? Uh, are we uh, speaking to you? Um, I'm based in Auckland in the north of New Zealand. Okay. No worries. No worries. Um, so obviously some uh, very uh, interesting endemic uh, bird life in New Zealand. Um, but uh, let's, uh, let's move straight on to uh, Norfolk Island Green Parrots. Uh, Cyanoramphus cookie eye, is that correct? Cy that's, Cyanoramphus? That's correct, you got it. Wonderful, wonderful. So, um, they're uh, endemic to Norfolk Island, so off eastern Australia. Um, a m sort of smallish, medium sized, bright green parrot with a red forehead, a red stripe across each eye, and a dark blue leading edge on the wing with uh, red patches on uh, the sides of the rump. Uh, females being smaller and uh, a little bit less red, as far as I understand. Is that about right? That's correct. Um, they belong to a group of parakeets widespread in the South Pacific, and there are very little variations in the overall coloration. Um, the features that we use to tell the species apart are centered around um, the crown and the forehead. The, the coloration of the feathers around this part is what tells the species apart. Right, right. And I understand that, um, obviously, molecular uh, data is, is very helpful with these very similar looking species and uh, cookie eye the Norfolk Island was only fairly recently uh, by molecular data kind of uh, delimited as, a, as its own species is that is that is that correct that's absolutely correct so uh, you can find um, overall green with red crown parakeets from uh, New Caledonia Norfolk um, New Zealand and even onto the Subantarctic Islands but this uh, external morphology doesn't really tell you the evolutionary history of the species. That's why molecular studies are so useful in helping us tell apart 
um, externally similar species, um, you know, based on their evolutionary history. Even though they look very similar to subantarctic species, for instance, they have a completely different um, time scale of colonization and um, they are quite different. But that only became apparent uh, in recent years. Right, right. And, and obviously when you know, you've got something that is considered one species and then you split a small group out of it using uh, you know, uh, by, you know, a new understanding of genetics, it kind of, it's a fairly small population size to work with, right? Yeah, um, so they are very good island colonizers, so they live on very small, you know, essentially rocks standing uh, in the middle of the South Pacific, and that's enough for them to colonize and, and survive, but obviously there is, you know, no place on Earth that escapes the effect of humans, and because we've brought with us, as we explore further corners of the planet, we bring with us a lot of pests, um, the combination of pests, humans and parakeets doesn't always uh, has a happy ending. And that unfortunately has been the case for the Norfolk Island uh, parakeets. Right, right. So I understand they're um, currently uh, endangered under the uh, Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act of 1999. And um, by the 1970s, due to these multiple pressures, uh, there was uh, less than 50 of them uh, suspected to be alive. Now, um, what was uh, some of those problems? Uh, obviously, you mentioned uh, the, the pests that we bring with us here. I understand that rodents um, were actually quite a significant issue. Uh, that's correct. So it's actually a combination of factors. It's, not, it's, it's hardly ever the case that a single factor uh, plays um, you know, the entire role of uh, explaining the decline or disappearance of the species. But the Green parrots of Norfolk Island are a textbook example of an island endemic that uh, responds to introduced predators. Their whole behavior is um, uh, typical of isolated islands where they can um, spend extended periods of time, periods of time on the ground um, because there are no ground predators and suddenly you have rats and cats in the picture and obviously they are not evolutionary evolutionarily uh, selected to cope with this pressure. So the numbers have started to go down. And yeah, by the 70s, they were pretty much gone. They were restricted to a few um, areas on Norfolk Island. The only remnants of native forest um, on this side. Right, right. And, and on top of the, um, the introduced species, um, uh, sorry, the mammalian species, I understand that there was some competition from introduced birds as well for um, nesting hollows, which Oh, were already in short order due to clearing during settlement on Norfolk Island. That's correct. Um, humans brought with them crimson rosellas from mainland Australia, starlings, and um, even uh, bees. And all of these uh, creatures require hollows like the gr green parrots to nest. So you have on the one side predators targeting ground foraging species, uh, ground foraging individuals, and also a lack of suitable nesting sites. So it's just a recipe for disaster. Right, so bees as well occupying hollow nests for, you know, uh, you know obviously beehives, um, you know, that would pretty much exclude a parrot from being able to use that hollow, <laughs> I imagine. That's right, and uh, sometimes you get a nasty surprise when you inspect a potential nest and suddenly you hear this buzzing around your head, so you just have to duck and run because, yeah, they, they can be very aggressive. Oh, that's always fun to find in the field. <laughs> All right, well, so look, there's... Wouldn't this private fun? Oh, well, it can be entertaining, at least, if you're watching from the outside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So, obviously, quite a few, um, you know, multiple pressures here um, for, for these birds and, um, you know, struggles for, to, you know, get breeding programs up, uh, as far as I understand. What were some of the actions that were taken to um, try to reverse this trend? Well, the history of the conservation of the green parrot has gone through different stages, and as more knowledge becomes available, those um, approaches have changed. Um, green parrots follow the same pattern that um, New Zealand parakeets, which belong to the same genus, have followed on other islands, uh, whereby the introduction of predators um, makes the numbers go down, and shortage of nesting sites following clearing of forests or competition with species also limits their productivity. But luckily for the green parrots, a lot of the recipes for recovery were being developed in New Zealand. So um, while in the uh, 70s and 80s there was a lot of emphasis on breeding them in captivity and releasing them into the wild, that had a, a very small effect because 
and the predators were still running rampant. So then um, a modification to include a predator control component was developed um, linked to captive breeding, but there was still not enough uh, nesting sites. So it wasn't until around the uh, mid-80s when the combination of um, safe nesting sites control of predators and competitors and captive breeding that came into place, that the population actually had a recovery that was significant from the very low uh, numbers in the 70s. Right. So obviously the uh, breeding program itself, those newly uh, released animals were just falling victim to the same pressures that everything else was. That's correct. And uh, captive breeding is important uh, for many conservation programs around the world, but um, there is something about Cyanoramphus parakeets, where they are very productive in captivity, but they don't perform very well once released into the wild, and this has been a consistent problem across species. So, um, with all this information at hand, um, it wasn't until um, the late 90s that um, it was decided to call it quits on the captive breeding program because of the kind of more limited success that it had in comparison to other uh, programs. Um, so the focus shifted again um, to based entirely on provisioning safe nesting sites and uh, maintaining um, predator numbers down in the core breeding area of the island. Right, right. So that's basically trapping uh, cats and rodents uh, near the parrot nesting sites. And uh, as far as I understand, uh, some revised rodent baiting and culling of those avian nest competitors as well, those unfortunately introduced bird species. That's right. Um, we have to remember that a lot of these introduced species are used to some of the predators that um, are now you know, found in Norfolk. So it makes no difference for them to deal with those things because they know how to avoid them and you know how to escape them and have alarm calls and all. Whereas you have... Um, a species, the green parrot, that is already in low numbers and is behaviorally not equipped to cope with this added pressure. So, you know, ameliorating those pressures is the key to um, promoting the recovery of the species. But it also, uh, a very important point here to keep in mind is that this kind of management cannot be interrupted. The moment that you start stepping back on calling invasive species or provisioning safe nesting sites, the population is going to respond in the same direction that it was before. So that is one of the biggest challenges for island conservation. You cannot really go with a sort of um, sticky band-aid approach to fix problems. You have to develop long-term solutions built around the biology of the species. So ultimately, the more you know about the species, the better the solutions that you can provide, but they are going to be in the long run for as long as the predators and the other pressures are uh, present on the side. Right, right. And obviously with, you know, islands being the hotbed of adaptation, there's always different pressures and different species issues to, to deal with as well. That's right. But um, one uh, very cool feature about islands is that they are small, closed systems. So you can actually have plenty of room for adaptive management and, you know, it is not a, a comparable situation to endangered species across vast areas. On mainlands, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So that's, that's why there is such an emphasis on island species for conservation because not only uh, the largest number of threatened vertebrates are found on islands, but the solutions from islands can be replicated in different parts of the world. So even though I'm based in New Zealand, we are kind of applying the, if you want to call it, Kiwi model to a situation in Australia on Norfolk Island. And I'm doing the same in other islands around the world. So that's the beauty of working with island species for conservation. You can actually see the response of the species with comparatively shorter time frames than to mainland species. Right, that's fantastic. Well, look, speaking of the uh, response of the species, um, what is the, uh, what's the situation for Norfolk Island parrots uh, currently? Um, I understand that the numbers are starting to increase during some of the surveys? That's right. In 2013, we started a very aggressive uh, campaign to save the species. And obviously, I'm just kind of speaking here um, on behalf of these um, organizations because it requires 
a huge team of people and multiple organizations to come together and agree on the conservation outcomes. And uh, from then uh, to now, the population has gone through some really positive uh, changes. The numbers are up. We estimate that there is about 350 of them now, compared to a low of between 50 to 90 in 2013. So that's a, a huge recovery, you know. Um, the other really good thing is that now they are spreading outside the boundaries of the protected area of Norfolk Island, which is in the northern part. Um, so this means that now you can see the species in, in your backyard if you are a, a resident of Norfolk Island. And that, uh, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's, that's great because people get to see um, the species in their own um, backyard. Another improvement is that um, now we have a better understanding on uh, the number of chicks that each breeding pair can produce, and we found out that they can actually reach maturity very, very quickly. So you can have uh, birds that are just over one year of age starting to prospect uh, potential nests. So they have a huge recovery potential, but obviously there is only a limited um, amount of available habitat on the island. So now we're trying to understand what will be a realistic um, number to set as a conservation goal for uh, the next 10 to 20 years? Well, that's that's still a fantastic increase to go from, uh, well, potentially, what, 50 to 90 to 350. So that's, um, that's some excellent news. Um, what do you think are some of the reasons for the success? Obviously, the... Um, the uh, the mating behavior of the bird seems to be quite uh, conducive to recovery once you uh, mitigate some of those those risk factors and then provide them with breeding habitat. Yes, that's correct. But um, I think ultimately it is in their biology. Imagine these um, parakeets colonizing islands over evolutionary time. If you are maturing sexually quickly and you are a generalist feeder, that is that you can feed on whatever is around, and you only need a cavity to nest, whether that's on a tree or in a hole in the ground, then you have a better chance to actually colonize those islands. If you're slow growing and highly specialized, maybe your chances of establishing successfully on islands will be very, very slim. So I think that's the key of the of understanding the biology of the species and adapt the conservation around that rather than trying to feed them to pre-assume um, you know, uh, restrictions within our uh, conservation mentality. Um, one thing that the parakeets have that works to their advantage is that they are very flexible in their diet. So we've observed them feeding on roughly 45 different species of plants and they adjust to whatever is uh, most abundant. So it's not a highly specialized feeder, but they just go for whatever is around. This of course has the um, less pleasant effect that they they have taken a, a taste for some crops and some stone fruit that humans like as well. So now we're, you know, trying to manage that um, new conflict because, you know, if you are growing, say, peaches or apples in your backyard, you don't want to see a bunch of parrots just eating them, right? But this is a situation that happened before. So, again, the, the, the long-term conservation of the species is now encompassing aspects that you know, which were happening before. Right, right. Well, look. Obviously, there's um, there there is still some very strong community interest in um in you know these birds, uh, despite some of their their negative impacts. I, I understand that the uh, community itself was uh, uh, fairly involved in some of the the monitoring of the declines. That's right. So my role in this whole uh, journey has been more providing scientific advice, but the work on the ground has been done by staff from the Norfolk Island uh, National Park and um, the Australian government, you know, the Department of Environment, and also the local community. Endless volunteer hours have gone into reporting where the parrots are, checking that um, they are still seen on the tracks, and obviously the, the heavy lifting or setting up the nests and controlling the predators is just enormous. And I think that uh, sometimes uh, we just become used to, to bad news, to hearing that things are going extinct and disappearing, but the recovery of the green parrot is something that Australia and Norfolk Islanders should be really proud of because worldwide you don't hear of many cases of such a um, recovery in such a short time and it's testimony to the positive effects of um, collaborating, you know, universities with government agencies. And I know it sounds a bit like a pigeon sort of answer, but 
it is the truth. It, this could have not been um, achieved without the cooperation of you know hundreds and hundreds of people from different um, walks of life and different organizations. Um, the other, yeah, the other key element to all of this is that ultimately the green parrot is endemic to Norfolk Island, even though there is a bit of debate about you know whether or not it's a separate species. It is only found on Norfolk Island, and I think that. Um, the people who live on, on the island are very well aware of this because, you know, this is just one of the multiple uh, endemic species on the island. So this is linked to um, a living experience of being a Norfolk Islander of their identity. And that has been a driver for me as well. Um, there is little value in just providing detached um, scientific advice. I have, um, I feel closer when I can see that it actually has an effect to a real life experience of the people working on the ground. So that has been the driver for this work and I, I hope that I continue to be part of this in years to come. Awesome, awesome. Well look, um, I mean, everybody's commitment to this project is, is uh, you know, obviously really great to see. And uh, look, we do have to wrap things up, but just before we go, um, how's the future looking for the uh, Norfolk Island Green Parrot? I think we have, um, we are uh, about to witness um, an even greater recovery of the species if the current management continues. But now the next step will involve moving green parrots to Phillip Island, uh, where they used to exist, uh, which is now predator-free and it has recovering vegetation, so we could establish another population there. And in the long term, I don't see a reason why, from a, from a strictly technical point of view, we couldn't think about moving green parrots to places like North Howe, for instance. Of course, this will involve uh, extensive consultation with the people on North Howe and, and, Lo and Norfolk Island to see if this, uh, that is a desirable outcome. But from a strictly scientific and technical point of view, there is no reason why this couldn't be. So imagine in 30 years telling your children or grandchildren that, you know, a once almost extinct species is now found on two islands in the South Pacific and is thriving. Wouldn't that be awesome? Oh, fingers crossed. That's, uh, that'd, that'd be a beautiful outcome. Uh, Louis Lanz, I think we have to wrap it up there. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and uh, yeah, this has been super fascinating. Thanks for the opportunity. All right, everybody, that's been Louis Ortiz Cathedral. Plenty more wildlife taking cocktails case studies coming up for you soon. Cheers, mate. This time involving two species, the noisy scrub bird and the western ground parrot. Our uh, main guest for today is Ms. Sarah Comer from the Center of Excellence in Natural Resource Management at the Uni of WA, where she's currently a PhD student. Uh, Sarah is also a regional ecologist for the South Coast region at the WA Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions. Uh, she's joining us now from uh, somewhere in WA. Uh, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, pleasure to have you on the show. Where, uh, where are you calling us uh, uh, from at the moment? Um, oh, good afternoon, Yanni. I'm somewhere on the south coast of WA, um, near Albany. Right, so obviously afternoon there still. Oh, it's, it has gone afternoon here as well. Uh, <laughs> all right, well, um, uh, so for those of you uh, who uh, don't know, Sarah's been uh, working on uh, noisy scrub birds and western ground parrots, so we should get into this uh, case study here. So um, the noisy scrub bird, uh, a trichocornus clomosus. Um, from what I understand, they're a pretty small, solid little bird. Is that correct? Um, yeah, Atricornis clamosus, Yanni. Um, they're small. Um, the males weigh on average around 50 grams um, and the females around 34 grams. Um, but interesting in that they're, they're basically a flightless bird. Um, so, you know, they spend most of their time hanging around in dark, dense, rank scrub um, on the ground, rarely seen, often heard. Right, so small rounded rings, tough little legs. Oh, very much so. Lots of muscles in the thighs. <laughs> awesome. Very interesting. Um, so these were uh, discovered in uh, southwest uh, WA in 1842. Um, and uh, following that, obviously, uh, there were some issues with clearing and altered fire regimes following the European colonization, which led to some severe declines. And they were thought extinct. Is, uh, is that correct? 
Yeah, that's right. Um, Gilbert collected them in 1842 up just south of Perth in the Darling Range, and despite a lot of effort um, for around 70 years, they weren't weren't rediscovered until 1961 when the small population was found at Two People's Bay, um, which is uh, just east of Albany. Right. So, um, how was how how did that discovery come about as well? Um, it was a, it was a local school teacher who spent a lot of time bumping over you know very rough tracks out to Two People's Bay looking looking for um, bristlebirds interestingly um, which is another species covered covered by our recovery team and um, the call of the scrub bird is is really quite remarkable um, very loud and melodic and I think he he sort of was onto it pretty quickly and and um, yeah everybody got very excited. So it's something that was really uh, first identified by the call. Yeah, yeah, and and interestingly, um, you know, this species is one. Well, the ground parrot's much the same. You're much more likely to hear them than you are to see them. <laughs> right, very very cryptic. They're not good uh, for twitchers, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, yet they're always out there twitching for them. Um, so obviously, after that, some uh, conservation efforts uh, very much began um, around Two People's Bay, um, and eventually uh, covering other species. For example, as you mentioned, the uh, the Western ground parrot. Yeah, that's right. And 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 I mean, I think you know, the Two People's Bay story was really interesting um, in that it was had it been earmarked by the state government to become another town, um, a satellite town. Um, for Albany as it grew and so it was you know a fairly big decision changing that um, to, to actually turn it into a nature reserve um, primarily for the conservation of the scrub bird at the time um, but then the landscape now um, we know is incredibly important for n not just birds but also some of the mammals that are really restricted in range. Yeah, right. That's uh, it's it's really interesting how um you know often one conservation action can have all these uh, flow-on effects. You know, p particularly when you're protecting landscape and ecosystems. There's going to be a lot of other species involved that are um, you know reliant on it. So I'm guessing uh, the scrub birds and uh, western ground parrots uh, have some similar ecological characteristics. Um, oh no, not really. Um, I think it. Oh, uh, I think um, it was it was just a, a remarkable. I mean. A remarkable event that that area was was reserved and and it wasn't just two people's bay it was sort of a, an area of around thirty thousand hectares um, which included Mount Many Peaks and and some of the low heaths to the north of Mount Many Peaks which is another granite range near um, Chains Beach and and that is actually habitat for the ground parrot so quite different um, quite different niches if you like um, but but. The diversity of the different habitats in that particular area um, managed to conserve those two birds amongst others. Um, and then, then of course, you know, the ground parrot was also known from areas to the east of Albany and also the west um, not that long ago, you know, in the 60s. Hmm. Right, so it really prefers those heathlands compared to the uh, uh, slightly thicker scrublands of the uh, scrub bird, obviously. Yeah, so the, so the ground parrot, um, as, as its name suggests, you know, spends most of its day on the ground um, feeding and then nests on the ground um, and, and roosts close to the ground so that, you know, dense, dense scrub, you know, that's, that's a little bit higher isn't much good for them. Um, yeah, so, so that, that sort of habitat in the Two People's Bay Many Peaks area is restricted to the sort of flats um, that, that are adjacent to the granite hills. Right, right. Um, and, you know, very interesting with the Western ground parrot, um, Pazoporus flaviventris, for those of uh, you listening at home. Um, it's about 30 centimetres. It's kind of a grassy green with black and yellow mar markings, particularly on the underside um, and sort of the underside of the tail, as I understand. Um, now, initially described in 1911, uh, like the scrub bird, it was thought extinct or, or, or had, uh, had already pretty much disappeared from WA at the time until it was rediscovered as well, is that correct? Uh, yeah, the, the, it was a very low reporting rate and I guess this is one of the problems, you know, when you're dealing with um, cryptic species. Um, you know, the ground parrot only calls reliably before the sun comes up and after the sun goes down and, you know, it's, it's quite unusual to actually flush a bird and see a bird on the wing. So, you know, you, you, and you need to know what you're listening for. Um, the, the calls superficially similar to tawny crown honey eaters that are found in most habitat occupied by ground parrots. So, you know, they're, they're, it's probably um, 
just just the challenges of detecting them and we still struggle with some of that today <laughs> yeah so i understand that it's super super cryptic and a lot of effort goes into finding even the um samples that have been found um found to date and, and from what i understand as well they were um they used to be considered a subspecies of the eastern ground parrot until um rather recently around 2011 when um cytochrome b uh, mitochondrial dna um was uh, studied and they found about a five percent sequence difference and which they estimated to be you know maybe about two million years divergent so even though they're you know very very similar to the eastern ground parrot again they're they're hugely hugely different and very very separate they are they are and um and you know we 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 actually believe you know they're quite different to look at um well su subtle differences i should say um and 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 quite a bit of variation in the calls as well okay yeah so it's a significant length of time that they've been isolated over here and very yeah okay um and you know they estimated that i think in the paper that i read about two million years ago that aridification in the center kind of probably separated the two populations Right. Well, anyway, um, critically endangered on the IUCN Red List and uh, EPBC Act, uh, as I understand, pretty much two small populations, and uh, and that's about it currently. Is that is that about right? Well, it's it's interesting. It's it, it, I think it's it, it's only known from one area, one national park um, reserve system, so Cape Arid and Noitsland, which sort of abut each other um, east of Esperance. Um, we haven't been able to detect birds in the Fitzgerald River National Park for the last um, seven year, six years. Um, so 2012 was the last time we heard a bird there. And as recently as 2004, we heard birds near Wychinicup. So, you know, they've declined pretty dramatically in a very short period of time. And um, despite our efforts to find them in the Fitzgerald River National Park, we haven't been successful yet. Well, the search continues. I, I, I assume. <laughs> um, yeah, 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 yeah. We, we, we're still doing a lot of work trying to locate a population there, um, and using some of the technologies that we're using to monitor the remaining population out in Cape Arid. All right, very cool. So, um, you mentioned there's been some declines recently, and there was also those, um, you know, older, you know, lost through habitat for agriculture, and. Um, you know, oh, there's obviously a few other issues. What what are the kind of the main problems that I guess noisy scrub birds and western ground parrots are facing in in that in that area? Um, I think the, the land clearing was largely historical, and um, you know that 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 in WA um, was you know still going on in through in the 70s, and you know there's that wonderful story of. Um, Brenda Newby, who was one of the founding members of the Friends of the Western Ground Parrot, and her husband found a small stretch of land on the northern part of the Fitzgerald River National Park um, that was about to be cleared and found ground parrots in it, and that resulted in that being reserved as well. Um, fire is really challenging, large landscape scale fires um, which remove the structure um, either of the heaths or the denser vegetation that the scrub birds need. Um, and for scrub birds, um, they're, a, they're an insectivore, so, so they need the really well-developed leaf litter to forage in um, for, the, for the invertebrates. And so, you know, there's, a, there's obviously a bit of a lag between a fire and habitat becoming suitable again, um, generally 10 years plus. And ground parrots, we think... Um, you know that they they certainly need the thicker vegetation to roost in. Um, after a fire, it, it takes quite a few years for that that structure to, to get to a stage where it's giving them cover from from predators. And their their introduced predators are probably you know the next biggest threat that we're tackling. Um, um, foxes and and feral cats. Um, and and we know that you know we know that they're an issue for scrub birds. We've this is the PhD coming in. I've you know we've we've pulled scrub bird feathers out of cat stomachs, um, and and um, and we you know our assumption is that the successful control of foxes in the Fitzgerald River National Park may have led to a mesa predator release of feral cats, which has probably you know knocked knocked the population fairly significantly out there. So yeah, they're, they're the big ones. So the fox population was possibly having some impact on the cat population, and now that's been uh, mitigated by removing the foxes. Yeah, and, uh, it's 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 a hi hypothesis that's hard to prove, but um, you know that's sort of the 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 
the theory that we're working with at the moment and the timeline seems to work for you guys does it or? yeah definitely definitely i mean it was it was quite interesting because in the fits where there's some been some pretty um pretty rigorous monitoring of ground parrot populations the the um number of calls per listening survey increased quite significantly um following fox baiting which started in the 19 or 1996 and so there was this lovely sort of you know upward trend in the in the curves the monitoring curves and then a few years later that that just died did a nose dive and um yeah yeah and then when we when we went and had a look out in the park we realized that the the density of cats had just gone through the roof um and yeah, so you know, these are, this is one of the wonderful things about ecology: all these relationships and and complex systems that we're trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah, it's not always a one uh, one hit solution. So obviously, fire reducing some of that um, p potential scrubby habitat not a great thing, and then reducing you know areas where things can hide from feral cats and you know foxes, and then those introduced species themselves. Um, that's a fair bit to deal with. What kind of uh, actions uh, are being taken uh, for scrub birds, uh, scrub birds um, and, uh, and uh, ground parrots in the area? Um, so th there's a significant amount of, of management that's done through um, our department, um, fire management, which is you know, really um, focused on engaging with on-ground managers and um, having fire regimes that um, you know, leave small pockets of unburnt habitat. Um, so we're, we're looking for a much smaller mosaic, um, trying to maintain for noisy scrub birds, you know, long, longer unburnt habitat in some areas. Um, right. Instead of one big intense fire, a, a mosaic of patches that, that have different intensities, some areas left unburnt. Yeah, just kind of... little refuges, you know, and, and, and having a sort of, you know, having having a scale of, of patchiness that gives um, you know gives both birds some some capacity to, to um, recover from the fires and and that of course is complement complemented by the introduced predator management so we've been really proactive um, in in um, trialing the cat bait um, eradicate um, we we had a five-year project testing that um, in ground parrot habitat across the south coast, um, and and we've had some really good success in in some years um, with with the knockdown of feral cats, and then um, actually you know having a bit of a strategy to go in after the baiting and pick up any animals that we may have missed, um, and then incorporating that into our fire management, so we know that the cats are coming into fire edges. Um, after after a wildfire or after a prescribed burn, and and trying to, you know, provide a bit of additional protection. So we're pretty busy. <laughs> yeah. Right. Wow. Um, that's a. Uh, it's very interesting. That's quite a. So you you've got the uh, fire management, and uh, then the sort of very uh, integrated um, feral species management. Is is there a lot of translocation going on as well for scrub birds um, and things like that? So yeah, that was that. That's the other sort of that's the other arm, I guess. Of you know, there's the on-ground management, and then there's actually managing the population. Um, the scrub bird translocation program actually started in 1983, and and um, interestingly, um, was was a, a, the first couple of years were done in close consultation with um, Don Merton from New Zealand, um, from Department of Conservation over there, um, and. Um, that that program, which has seen quite a lot of birds moved, has actually created new populations. And you've got to remember, scrub birds are functionally flightless, so they don't fly. Um, they need corridors of vegetation, you know, to get into suitable habitat. And so, and and they have a really low fecundity. Um, you know, one egg a year, um, so very low reproductive rate. And um, so the you know assisting them by identifying new habitat and putting animals over there has actually resulted in them being able to build up numbers and withstand the impacts of fire. Um, so yeah, we're still going with the translocation program. Um, we we haven't had a lot of success in areas outside of the Albany coastal area east of town. Um, we've got. A really good population on an island just off the coast, Bald Island, um, and we're looking at um, doing 
some more translocation work this year um, with with fires that we've had it in Two People's Bay. We're bringing a few animals back this way and um, also looking at trialling um, an island in the Recherche Archipelago off es Esperance, um, which looks like it meets all the criteria for good scrub bird habitat. <laughs> um, and ground parrots we haven't been able to translocate yet. So, yeah. So, so look, I, I hear that the uh, scrub birds are doing fairly well. You know, they've got you know much larger populations than at least two de decades ago, and uh, uh, it, it, together with the uh, management strategies, the risk for extinction for a lot of different species in the area has really probably been reduced. Probably including the, including the western ground parrot. But what's the situation with them now as well? So, so this. They're basically, um, you know, that, that decline since the early 2000s um, has been really significant, um, you know, in the area that's occupied um, and also in the population. But I think the really encouraging thing is, you know, we, we, we monitor that, that species in autumn every year. Um, that's kind of the best time to, to monitor them. And, um, you know, with all our efforts in Cape Arid and in spite of... Um, two very large fires that took out 90% of the known habitat in 2015, we haven't seen a decline in that area. So I think it's the combination of, you know, trying to, trying to manage the introduced predators and, you know, now we're, now we're looking forward um, to actually creating that mosaic and, you know, having some, some refuges in, in that area. Um, so we're holding we're holding the fort. Um, we've got a small number of birds up in Perth Zoo, um, which we took into captivity um, originally back in 2009 and 2010 um, because we didn't know a if ground parrots could be kept in captivity and b if they would breed in captivity. And um, we've answered the first question, and you know the recovery team's now in the process of. of deciding you know whether we actually put more birds into the zoo to give it a good shot at, at captive at breeding them in captivity um, so they're sort of you know they're, they're the sort of things that are going on with ground parrots and ultimately we want to be able to um, establish another population um, so we're, we're, we're that's that's sort of on our horizon at the moment um, and, and hopefully we'll be able to do that um, the scrub bird story has demonstrated that you know, having eggs in multiple baskets buffers you from the stochastic sort of events that, that do happen. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're not all going to get wiped out by one fire. But look, this is all very interesting. But we do have to kind of uh, wrap this case study up. Um, I guess just uh, uh, quickly before we go, um, obviously you, you guys are having a, some quite significant success with the scrub birds and, uh, you know, all the other co-occurring species and with protecting um, western ground parrots despite all the fires and challenges. Just before we go, what do you think are some of the reasons for the success and what, do you, what are the future, what's the future look like for both of these species at the moment? Um, well, I'm an optimist. <laughs> so we, we have to be optimistic, you know, in this, in, this, um, in this discipline that we work in, don't we? Um, yeah, yeah, totally. I think, I think the, you know, the recovery team um, and the amalgamation of um, individual species recovery teams into a single recovery team in 96 um, is is a really cohesive group. Um, you know, it's a it's a has representatives from community and um, you know different institutions and and I think it, it, it just the, the the commitment and the dedication of people that have been involved in these programs is is and since the 60s. Um, you know, is is one of the reasons that that the future does look brighter. Yeah, it's always inspiring to see. Yeah, and strong, strong community support. You know, we have a, a phenomenal um, amount of support from volunteers um, who participate in the programs. And I think that's, you know, it's just wonderful um, getting people out in the bush and having them out in the darkness, watching the sun comes up, listening to parrots. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, it sounds like a fun time to me. Um, and um, so the future is looking good for these species at the moment. You think um, there's a, a bit of uh, reasons reasons to have hope anyway. Yeah, yeah. We just we just don't want to take our finger off the pulse now. You know, we need to we need to keep going. I think we've we've done some really good work. You know, collaboratively. I say we. There's loads of people involved um, in the last you know five to ten years. 
in particular with ground parrots um, and, and we need to keep going with scrub birds. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. Absolutely. Look, Sarah, I think that's pretty much it for our case study today. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, hopefully we can talk to you at some point in the future. Yeah, fabulous. Thanks, Yanni. All right, cheers. No worries. See ya. Cheers. Bye. Environmental manager, uh, environment and business management at the Newcastle Uni. Uh, Tim has worked in threatened species conservation for 21 years uh, with the Southeastern Red Tailed Black Cockatoo Recovery Team, the Eastern Bard Bandicoot Recovery Team, and uh, the National Mallee Fowl Recovery Team, which we'll be talking about today. He's currently the National Coordinator for the National Mallee Fowl Recovery Team out of Casterton, Victoria. And he's here to talk to us today. Uh, Tim, how are you doing, mate? Oh, well, thanks. How are you? Very, very well. And how's your day been, mate? Uh, been, been busy out there in the field? Yeah, yeah. They had a lovely day, actually. Um, spotted some southeastern red-tailed black cockatoos today. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. And obviously the, the mallee fowl are a little bit harder to spot than the, uh, than the old cockatoos. Yes, they are. They're quite cryptic. They're, well, they're also another hour or two further north than when I, where I am down south. But, um, yeah, uh, very hard to see. We have volunteers out there for maybe 10 years sometimes doing monitoring, and they never got to see a bird until year 10. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, look, let's uh, get into this case study. So the mallee fowl, Leipoa ocelata, is that correct? Yes. Right, so they're a stocky, about chicken-sized, ground-dwelling megapode. That means a uh, large-footed, uh, basically, for the, uh, the bird uh, family here. Um, very intricately patterned and modelled plumage and makes them perfectly uh, adapted with that mallee scrub camouflage look. Yeah, yeah, they, they blend in very well. Right, right. And so, obviously, sometimes it takes up to 10 years to, to spot one. <laughs> yes, um, I'm sure that's an extreme. Yeah, right. Um, but obviously, these are large nesting mounds made by males, as is pretty typical of megapodes, um, with no paternal care after the eggs hatch, uh, using compost and solar energy, um, even like other megapodes using volcanic heat. Um, is that right? Yes, yes. So ours is a bit unique. Like, there's probably about, I think, I think there's about 32 different megapodes. Um, and in Australia, we have three. So you've got your um, bush, bush turkey, your orange-footed um, fowl up in the tropic areas, and then you've got our mallee fowl. And the biggest thing about the mallee fowl, well, I mean, they're all quite amazing in that they use these large mounds to incubate their eggs. But the thing about the mallee fowl is it's the only one out of the 30-odd that um, does it in the, in the arid zones. So the trick there is it doesn't have enough, you know, we all know what it's like when you compost material in your compost, it gets warm. So that heat is what is used by many of the megapodes to keep the egg at the right temperature. Um, right, such but, as bush turkeys and even crocodile mound nests and things like that. Sorry, what was that? Just like uh, uh, the brush turkeys up here on the east coast and even things like crocodile mounds for their eggs and things like that. Well, yeah, these ones are kept warm by using some other means. So um, you know, you, your composting material is keeping the eggs nice and warm. But in the arid zones, that composting material runs out of all of its moisture, you know, into this nesting season. So the our birds have to open up the nest and allow the uh, soil to heat up in the sun. And then they put that back in. And as you say, the, the mounds are huge. So six, six metres diameter is quite typical um, and a metre high. So when you find one and it's, being, it's active, it's uh, quite a scene. Right, right. So that's obviously the uh, solar energy. They're kind of using that sand spread out over a big mound and then scraping it on top of a like a bit of a central divot yeah so what they do in the early part of the season is they'll uh, open up a large this large hole they'll put in their compostable material or leaves and bits and pieces and uh, once it's wet then they can cover it in and it'll um, create heat but then once it's stopped you, you know like your brush turkey can keep on putting in more wet stuff um, yeah. Ours, it runs out of that because it's getting too dry, and then um, it will. That's when it does what, as you just described, it opens it up and allows the, the soil to heat in the sun. Yeah, very, very cool. Now, unfortunately, uh, they're vulnerable under the uh, EPBC Act of 1999 and threatened in uh, the states where it does occur. Um, 
So what exactly was the problem for the Malifaux? Well, for starters, it was the uh, Malifaux territory uh, coincides very closely to a lot of your best, um, sort of your wheat belt. And so something like about 80% of their uh, the country in wheat belt type country was uh, cleared. So take away all the habitat, that, that's obviously a big thing. Um, when, and we, I've just mentioned that they use that vegetation and uh, you know, leaves and stuff to uh, actually uh, decompose and create heat. If you have a fire go through, well, that takes all of that material away and then they've got nothing to work with to do their, um, their, their breeding. So fire is obviously another big thing. Uh, and then there's predators. And then there's also competition from uh, other herbivores. So, you know, you, we, you've got deer, goats, um, you know, uh, kangaroos, a range of things eating the same stuff as them. So if you've got an uh, overabundance of those creatures in there, then, um, yeah, you can, you, you're taking away all their food source. Yeah, right. So obviously some pretty widespread uh, declines in the population um, with, uh, and, and that's quite a number of threats as well and a, and a, and a wide variety. Um, uh, it's, uh, I understand it's a bit hard to even tell which one of those threats is the most significant and where to kind of start tackling it. Well, so, yeah, so we've, we've commenced this, what is now described as the largest predator experiment in Australia, um, where we've got 20 sites across the nation, each with uh, an area where, where the treatment is going to happen, a predator control of some sort, uh, and they all have to be over 10,000 hectares, and many of them are large parks, so they'll be you know, a couple of hundred thousand hectares. Um, so, and then each one of these sites has to have a, a co coinciding site that is a control where nothing happens. So as a proper experiment, we're comparing similar patches uh, with a, a treatment and, and then without a treatment. And we're measuring both the outcomes on uh, predator activity. So we'll be measuring the pro foxes and cats and um, and then we'll also be measuring uh, the Malifaux by doing Malifaux monitoring at both sites. So we'll see a distinct link between the impact of doing predator control and what it does to Malifaux. I, I, I should emphasize that the last trend analysis that we had uh, was some time ago uh, and it couldn't find a link between the benefits of predator control um, on Malifaux production. So well, that's why this experiment um, is now underway. Right, right. So with, with that many different threats, uh, I guess, trying to figure out which one is the most important, that's why this large adaptive management trial over sort of uh, a large, basically across the entire species range, is that right? That's right, and that's what this experiment is uh, forms the basis of understanding. Well, the adaptive management part of it will be as we progress through time, we'll, we hope to see that some methods are having some impact, whether that be just on the predator activity or whether it's also on the malifowl breeding success. Um, and then people will change what they're doing, their treatment on the ground. So the predator control will be changed. And because we're working very closely with Melbourne University, uh, we have uh, mathematicians and uh, modelers down there working out what you know measuring what those changes will be so we can come back to some of these land managers and say that treatment you had there wasn't doing anything here's what what something that was doing something try that and if they're willing then we can keep on measuring what they're doing you know with the outcome of their changed habit or practice wow that's a pretty um huge sort of uh, co coordinated monitoring effort um, how, how important was the recovery plan um, uh, development and, uh, and and such in, in getting this going? Sorry, sorry what was that? How important was uh, the recovery plan development to um, to uh, to this 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 plan? Yeah, well, look, the recovery plan um, uh, identified the need for uh, this adaptive management project to identify what the you know well, what the impact of predators are. Um, so that it, it was doing that way back in two so well. The, the, we've just drafted up a new recovery plan and it's gone in even heavier saying that uh, yes this adaptive management um, experiments are really important but even more so important is all the volunteers that go out and monitor all of our mammoth house so, and their effort is about three and a half thousand mounds across Australia every year
Yeah, I un- I understand that that uh, those uh, volunteer champions are, are really out there doing a lot of the the monitoring, with being kind of guided by the recovery team. Yeah, so that, they're the backbone of everything that's happening to uh, you know for our understanding of Malifaux. As I say, it's we're also touting this as the largest single species monitoring project in Australia, with because you can imagine I just described these mounds. They're, they're large, but they're way out you know in the arid areas, so they're. Yeah, quite remote, and yet we can, our volunteers, hundreds of them, go out and monitor uh, three and a half to four thousand of those every year. And and then all of that data is goes because they're using um, smartphones, uh, the data goes straight up onto our database in a very quick time. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Wow, that's very cool. Um, so, look, obviously, um, you know, there's a. Uh, you guys have been since the first uh, recovery plans and now the updated recovery plans and all these are uh, you know amazing volunteers and everything out there you guys are putting a lot of work in on the ground uh what's the situation uh looking like now for uh Mally Fell, uh, in the uh in the areas that you guys are monitoring um well actually joe benchamesh is who is you know one of our champions that's been well, he's been working on Mally Fell for about 25 30 years um he did that last trend analysis, and that came out, but that was finalised in 2005. So um, the next one is coming out very soon, um, but I, and so I can only report, and I don't know what the outcome is, but um, I, I know that um, at the end of the last trend analysis, it was looking, you know, a little positive, but then there's been times in between there where it's looked quite dismal again. So yeah, I won't preempt what Joe's going to put out. <laughs> Well, look, um, I guess uh, we, we, I guess we all hope to, to be seeing some improvements since uh, that two thousand and five trend analysis. But um, I guess we're just going to have to wait. Um, but I, I guess that's also the advantage of having these uh, statistically robust systems in place to track the populations and uh, evaluate how your management plans are going. Yeah, that's just, that's exactly right. We, uh, I think it's recognised that um, one of the most important foundations of any recovery plan or actions is to have a good monitoring system in place. Um, without it, you've got no idea if anything that you're doing is, is um, having an outcome. Right, right. Well, look, speaking of, um, you, uh, obviously you guys have had some success with uh, monitoring and with, with management and some of these plans and uh, at least, you know, getting uh, some, you know, pretty uh, large scale uh, research projects going into finding out what can be done to help them. Um, and monitoring obviously being a, a key part of that. What are some of the other, um, you know, important factors and, and things that are going to make this kind of project successful? Um, well, especially just with the adaptive management thing, and so that that is now a partnership of many, many partners um, and players. So whether it be AWC, Bush Heritage, the you know, there's a couple of private landholders, there's a, numerous government departments and parks agencies. I think, you know, that now that they're all partners in this, and there's benefits for each one of them, it's not just an understanding of the impact of uh, their predator control on Malifaux, but it's also an understanding of what their predator control does to predators. Um, and being able to compare it across the nation is really important too. So that's one aspect. Uh, one of our big activities is working with all of the volunteers. So what the four volunteers can go out into the scrub they need to be trained in how to use our equipment and you know and also how to do it all safely and not put their lives at risk um, so we we spend a lot of time with training um, the the strongest of the all of our groups across Australia is the Victorian Malifaux recovery group uh, and they typically have about 70 people come to a camp each year at Wipperfield just for the training weekend um, yeah I know it's, it, and you know those, a lot of those people have traveled five hours to get there uh, and then they'll go out and spend a week, you know, going out doing the monitoring of because everybody gets their own sites to go to, uh, and they might spend some time. I know some groups go out a, a group of five couples, and they just slowly work around the five different sites um, and having a very enjoyable time of it all. <laughs> <laughs> That's really awesome. I mean, you look that um, that. Uh citizen science and uh, I guess volunteer community engagement is um, always seems to be really really important for these recovery projects yeah it's absolutely essential I mean the funding is, um, is very thin on the ground um, but also part of our job is um, Joe's developed the camera um, tests 
where we'll be using, we'll, in order to measure the predator activity, um, we have a lot of cameras out there. So we're processing thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of images. Um, and so again, that's our volunteers that come to the fore there um, and go through all of that stuff. So without volunteers, citizen scientists, uh, none of this could happen. Yeah, right. And look, obviously they are a, they are a fascinating species, uh, and uh, you know, I guess very uh, uh, in the hearts and minds of a lot of people out there in that northern Victoria area. Yeah, and look, when I travel across the country and I go out to these Mallee places, I'll go to a pub at night and sit down, and it doesn't matter who, just pretty much anybody. You say, "Oh, send any Mallee fowl," and they'll start telling you yarns about Mallee fowl. They're just a really loved species, and I. You know, you mentioned a couple of them. I didn't mention these huge mounds that they're building. They might move a ton of soil in a day. Wow. And do that every day. Um, you know, and, and as you mentioned, the when the chicks are born, they never see the parents. They, 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 they emerge out of this thing having dug for 24 hours and through a metre of soil, um, emerge out into the, the open, and they're on their own. They dash off. Within a day, they can get up into a tree. Um you know, and from then they've got some security against foxes. That first day, we'd, you'd lose a lot of chicks. Yeah, pretty precocious little things as soon as they come out of the egg, okay? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're crazy. And the, I mean, the female's task isn't terribly easy either. I mean, she's laying an egg that's 10% of her body weight. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. well, look, um, Tim, we better actually wrap this up. Just before we go, um, I know we spoke about um, some of these uh, trend analyses coming out um, shortly, uh, but what, uh, what, what do you think the future uh, is looking like for this uh, awesome species? Look, I think that if we can um, nail what the biggest threats are, then we've got a very good hope. I mean, if it, if it were that um, predator control isn't the answer, um, and let's say herbivore competition was the answer, and then we swung all of our resources that had previously gone into the other into something that we believe will work, then you know the, the, the outlook is very good, I think. Um, uh, one other little thing I want to quickly mention is we do have the National Forum, which uh, in Mildura this year, so if anybody wants to go onto our website, they can find out about uh, the gathering of about 150 people that happens every three or four years, and that'll be in Mildura in August. Excellent. The, uh, so that's the National Mallee Recovery Team Forum, is that right? That's right, yes. All right, wonderful, wonderful. So for anybody listening and interested in Mallee uh save that one in your books for uh, Mildura. All right, um, look, Tim, we've uh, we got to wrap this up here, but thank you so much for joining us. This has been super interesting, and if uh, we can uh, ever speak with you in the future, uh, we would love to. This has been, uh, yeah, fascinating. Thanks very much. It's lovely to talk to you. All right, that wraps up our bird conservation case studies for the book of hope. Plenty more case studies on the way soon, folks. You can check out the book now at CSIRO Publishing and other outlets. Just Google Recovering Australian Threatened Species and Book of Hope and check it out today. Don't forget to like and follow us at Wildlife King Cocktails on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so on. More WCC action coming soon. Cheers, everyone.